Hi, Ecology Lab. So this week's lab is all about biodiversity and how we quantify biodiversity. Now, ecologists care deeply about biodiversity because, well, biodiversity, we're talking about biological diversity, the number of, we often talk about species, so the number of species in, a, in an environment, uh, but we could talk about, you know, diversity of families, we could go up the, up the taxonomic um, chain, or we could go down, we could talk about um, genetic diversity and, and other sorts of things. But um, biological diversity is important because in degraded ecosystems where um, some key ecological processes are disrupted and you have, you know, extinction of different, um, different species, um, they tend to be less diverse. And in these degraded ecosystems, uh, we lose ecological function, right? So things, relationships and interactions between organisms can break down if you lower diversity. This is important to humans, of course, because we, we often have a, we can have a breakdown of ecosystem services, right? So these are things that ecosystems do for free that benefit humanity, things like pollination and primary production and um, decomposition of waste and filtration of water and all sorts of things that happen in different ecosystems. So um, for that reason, we often spend a lot of time figuring out how to measure and quantify diversity so we can compare and see the effects of different things on ecosystems. Um, so the simplest measure of diversity is species richness, right? So species richness is just you go somewhere and you count the number of species that you find, right? So in this top panel, um, we can see we have 16 organisms and eight of them are uh, tigers and eight of them are some other kind of feline, right? Um, but often just as important as the species richness, the number of species present, is also some measure of evenness. So you can you can imagine here uh, we have very little evenness, right? In this in, in B here, we can see we have lots of tigers and just a few of those other felines, so it's not very even. Over here, it's very even. We have again 16 cats, and I think we've got four lions and four tigers and four cheetahs and four something else, right? So um, there's evenness too. So we often come up with different indices of diversity to quantify some aspects of both richness and evenness. One of the most common ones is Shannon's index, or Shannon's H, and I'm also gonna talk about Hurlburt's pi. So Shannon's H index is a measure that incorporates both richness and evenness. And so we can see here, we calculate H here. Um, basically what, you're, what you do to calculate Shannon's H is you sum the proportions of species. Um, and then you multiply that by the by the natural logarithm of those proportions. So, um, for instance, to calculate this this pi, right, the proportion of one species. So, if we want to calculate that for tigers here, we can see we have four tigers, and there's 16 total cats. So, um, four out of 16, or 0.25, is the um, proportion of tigers, right? And then to calculate h, you do that for each species. Um, you'd multiply those proportions times the natural log, and then you'd sum them all up. Now, H is a little problematic in that it can be a little hard to interpret. By doing this, if you look into the details of Shannon's H, you're, calculate, you're, you're accounting for both um, diversity and evenness. Um, but again, you can get a high H with having either high diversity or high even, I'm sorry, high richness or high evenness. Um, or both, right? Uh, and then, you know, if you get a, a Shannon's H value of two, uh, is it exactly half as diverse as a Shannon's H of four? Well, not necessarily, because it's, it's an index and it's incorporating multiple things and we're not really sure what the, you know, the sampling distribution is and so on. So it's, um, it's a little messy to, to sort of compare. <clears throat> So a slightly uh, different approach here um, is, is the probability of interspecies encounter, or pi, or Hurlburt's pi. And this is actually based on probabilities, and so there's a distribution, and it's, it's a little more straightforward to compare. Um, so basically what pi calculates is if, if we sample two individuals from a community, um, what's the probability that there are two different species? So if I pull two random jelly beans out of this jar and we assume the different colors of jelly beans represent different species, um, if I randomly pull two out, what's the probability that they're gonna be two different colors, 
right? So again, uh, just like sampling the, the felines in the previous example, uh, you calculate the proportion of each um, uh, of each species, and then you square it and sum it and subtract that from one. This first part of the um, of the index is just a uh, to account for sample size, uh, small sample sizes. So we take the total population over uh, total population minus one. So this seems pretty good, right? Now we can get a probability. Uh, it's easy to interpret. You know, we, if we get a if we get a, a pi of 0.5, we know that we've got a 50% chance of randomly pulling two. If we pull two random individuals out of the community, that they're two different species, right? This is a nice, uh, nice intuitive index. But we have a problem, right? So of course, if we have jelly beans, we could dump the whole jar out and we could count we could separate all the jelly beans by color and we could count them and so on but ecosystems or, or ecological communities are really messy right and it's really hard to census the entire thing so we're probably going to have to calculate our diversity index based on um, a sample now the problem here is that some species are common and some species are rare right we might have a jelly bean jar and like half of the jelly beans are red um, and then there might be like two black jelly beans in there or something like that um, the other problem is the bigger sample we take, the more species we're likely to get, right? If I reach into this jelly bean jar and take a big old handful, I'm more likely to get rare species in my sample. So I'm more likely to get more species. And if I just take a little tiny handful, then um, you know, I'm less likely to capture the rare ones. So my, my total richness, my species richness is likely to be lower. Okay, so how do we deal with that problem? Well, one thing is if we can look at the species accumulation curve, right? So this is the idea that um, the more species, the more samples we take, the more species we're like to, likely to get. But the shape of that curve is going to change depending on how many rare species we have, right? So, uh, for instance, in the example here, we've got uh, species accumulation curves for moths and birds in Scotland. And so we see if we sample about, you know, 25 birds here, um, we've got almost all the species that are there. If we keep increasing our sample size, we're only likely to get a couple of more birds, right? The slope of that line levels off pretty quickly. With moths, however, you see the slope of the, the species accumulation curve uh, keeps growing. And so we might have to sample, you know, more than 125 species before the slope levels off and we can be confident that we've got most of them. So we have to figure out what is the shape of that curve to have some idea of how well we've sampled. So one approach to this is to basically extrapolate. And if we have a sample of a certain size, can we extrapolate the curve and figure out you know, how steep that curve is or, or where it's likely to level off? Uh, there's many methods to do this. One of them is the Chow 1 index. And so the Chow 1 index says here, um, the estimated number of species, right? So this is what we're trying to figure out. How many species are in that community if we completely sample it, right? So S sub estimate. Um, and what we do there is we take the number of uh, observations, so the number of species in our sample, right? Observations. And then we add this ratio. And so it's F sub one squared over two F sub two. And here F sub one is singletons and f sub 2 is doubletons and what those are is if we look here so we've got um, a, a, a data set here we've got beetle species is the first column and then from two different sampling sites from young plantations and old plantations these are, these are tree plantations um, <clears throat> so singletons are um, species in the sample where we have exactly one individual collected right so these species are all singletons in this plantation, in, in this sample site. And doubletons are where you have exactly two individual samples. So here we see we've got a couple of species where we've got two, right? So you're looking at your rare species and your ratio of where we could just get one or two, because remember, if we take a big sample, we're more likely to get just a couple of those. We're more likely to get some of those rare species. So we're looking at our ratio of rare species and adding it to our observation. And that should tell us, that should give us an estimate of the total sample size if we completely sampled by trying to extrapolate that species accumulation curve. Now there's another way to do this. 
And uh, that is if we, if we go, instead of extrapolating out the curve, we can maybe go back down the curve. So here's our same data set here, right? <clears throat> here's our beetle species, and we can see we've got young plantations and old plantations. And we can see the total richness, right? So we've got 31 species in the young plantations and only nine species in the old plantations. So we might think, you know, well, community, uh, the first community, young plantations, has more species. Um, but is this valid? Well, um, the Maybe not, because you see we've sampled a lot more. We've got 243 individuals in the young plantation sample and only 63 in the old plantations. So maybe the young plantations is really more species rich, or maybe it's just a function of our sample size, right? We don't know if it's actually a meaningful ecological difference or if it's a, just an artifact of our sampling. So one way we can deal with this problem is we can use this method called rarefaction. So with rarefaction, we're drawing a subsample from the, from the, from the, the, the sample with the larger uh, number of individuals, and we, we, we randomly pull out a smaller sample, right? So rarefy or to thin. So what we're going to do here is we take the, our, we have our, we know our younger, our Old plantations has 63 individuals, right? And we got nine species. So what we can do is we can go into our whole pile of uh, young individuals or young plantation, and we've got 243 individuals. So what if we just reach into that jelly bean jar of 243 individuals and we pull out 63, okay? And then we count how many species we get. Now, we can not only do that once, but we can do it a hundred times. We do it a thousand times. We can not only get the number of species, but we can get uh, a mean and a range, right? We can get a whole distribution of, um, of samples. Then we can compare that to the other, uh, to the old plantations in this case, and see if that difference is meaningful or not. So if we do that, um, this is the kind of graph we get. So remember our old plantations, remember we had 63 individuals, so that's somewhere around here, and we had nine species represented. And in our young plantations, we sampled, what did we say, 243 individuals, and we got 31 species, or something like that. Okay, so what we do is we can, at all these points along the curve, we can pull out that number of individuals, and we can see how many species we get. And again, we can do it 100 times, and then we can get a whole range of outcomes. So the, the light gray line here represents um, the average, and then the dotted lines represent the 95% confidence limits. So if we look back down the curve here where we had 63 individuals, we see the, the we had nine species uh, in the old plantation. In the young, when we do it a, 100 times, we get you know between 15 and 20 species. And you, furthermore, you see that the old plantation isn't even con contained within those 95% confidence limits. So we can be pretty sure that that difference is meaningful. That's a pretty big difference. Um, so that's how we do rarefaction. Um, and you can calculate Hurlbert's pi for these, right? So here we calculated pi for the young plantations and we get 0.88. And for the uh, old plantations and we get 0.8. 295. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, we sum those and we take one minus the sum. But anyway, if we calculate pi, we can see that pi for the young plantations is 0.92. So we have a 92% chance that if we pull two random beetles out of that sample, that they're going to be two different species. And in the old plantations, pi is only 0.7. So we have a 70% chance that if we reach into the old plantation sample, we get two different species. What's really interesting too, is that pi is related to rarefaction. Pi is actually the slope of the rarefaction curve at its origin. So the slope here would be 0.92 and the, point, the slope here would be 0 0.70. So that's pretty cool. Anyway, so rarefaction is a way to deal with differences in sample size, so we can know if our sampling effort is influencing our interpretation of diversity.